So, good morning, everyone. We'll start in a few moments. All right, so uh, today is the last real class of the semester, so the last lecture, in which we will see new theory. I remind you, if you forgot, next week, so next Monday, is the third uh, exam of the semester, which will be on quantum mechanics and nuclear physics. So to what, what we've seen uh, after the second exam. Afterwards, the other classes will be dedicated uh, for you to have time to work on some exercises to do a revision of the semester. I will hand you a few documents after the third exam uh, in order to guide you in this. Uh, yeah. So, uh, last week we started our study of nuclear physics, in which we saw first the binding energy, which was uh, the, the energy which enabled the nucleus to stay together despite uh, having a lot of positively charged particles in it. So this energy came from the difference between the mass of the components and the actual mass of the nucleus. And if we found the, the energy per nucleon, this was a hint of how stable the nucleus is. Some are more stable than others. And if they are stable, they will uh, decay towards a more stable configuration through a, a number of uh, a number, a number of types of decays, which we, we, which we also call radioactivity. First, there was the alpha decay, in which a helium-4 nucleus is thrown out. Beta plus decay, in which, uh, so I start with beta minus. Beta minus, in which a neutron turns into a proton and an electron is ejected. Beta plus, in which a proton changes into a neutron and a positron, the antiparticle of the electron, is ejected. So like an electron, same mass, but positively charged and uh, gamma decay, so just the emission of a photon, so pure energy being thrown out. Uh, uh, to find the energy in a given nuclear reaction, we compare the mass before and after. If uh, the energy was greater than zero, the, the, uh, the reaction was exothermic, could happen on its own. If it was less than zero, could not. And there were two main types of nuclear reaction. Fission, in which a large nucleus breaks down into smaller ones. And fusion, the inverse, in which uh, small nuclei combine into a larger nucleus. These were the two main types of nuclear reaction outside of the type of the case we saw. And uh, these each happened in, uh, in different situations. Fission, mainly in bombs and nuclear reaction, in which we needed a chain reaction for it to keep going and fusion, mainly in stars and uh, in hydrogen bombs, for now. Before we move on uh, to the last topic of nuclear physics, on what we saw so far on uh, the rest of the semester, anything, would you have some questions, some comments, something you'd like us to go over? As always, please don't hesitate later on to interrupt me if something comes up. 
a few questions turns out to be a bit long, you can just type uh, quickly type in question and I will know that, that I'll have to wait for you to finish typing. So on today's menu, uh, we'll talk about the rate of decay. So the, the rhythm at which decays will happen, they do not happen all at once, but over time. Afterwards, uh, we'll do a quick summary of the last part of the semester, quantum mechanics and, and nuclear physics based on the formula sheet. And uh, yeah, between the two, there will be an example too on the, the decay rate. So yeah, so the, the, uh, that's about what's on today's menu. So the main logic for the decay rate, so the, 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 the rhythm at which decays will happen, well, if you consider a very small time interval and you look at the nucleus during, during this time interval, it has two choices. First, it decays. Second, does it? So those of you taking uh, probability, probability stat in, and statistics will recognize a binomial distribution. And we name the probability per unit of time for the nucleus to, uh, to, the, to decay, lambda, here. And going forward, we'll also call it the decay constant. But in physical sense, is the, prob the probability per unit of time, so for a very, very small time interval, for nucleus to decay. So from this, so I, I won't do the demonstration. Okay, you can do it uh, if you want to. Uh, we can find after some time, uh, uh, the average. Uh, if we start with one nucleus, on average, how uh, how much how much between zero and one will we have after some time? And if we have a, a very large number n of independent nuclei, we can find further an average of how many we'll have to give after a given time. Which is the which is the sense behind the formula we'll be using? All of them will be mean values. So on average, how many we'll have? There can be fluctuations around around this number. These are uh, more important in small samples, but as long as, as we keep very large ones, the value we, we get from statistics should be pretty pretty good. So uh, the, the the after after going uh, through uh, the exercise of finding how many nuclei we have on average after a given after a given time t knowing how many we had before is given through the following formula so we have as stated the number of nuclei at a given time t n zero how many we had at a time we decide to call t equals zero so we'll always have two different times uh, so we'll we'll take the choice of naming one of them t equals zero it is our choice, it is our point of reference. And an exponential with a minus the probability per unit of time, the decay constant, times the time t during which we waited. So the more time we wait, the less uh, the less nuclei will be left because of, because of the minus sign. So this is an exponential decrease. So if we were to plot it approximately, so we have on the y-axis the number of nuclei, on the x-axis the time. The curve crosses the y-axis at a value n0 by definition, the number of nuclei we had at the start of, uh, of us counting, and decreases over time. The slope does not stay constant. We'll talk about it later, uh, later on when, when we introduce the actual uh, decay, decay rate. So uh, how uh, the uh, how many decay will will have will depend on how many nuclei we have. So the less we have, the less decay will also measure. And we can define a very specific time, which we'll call the half life, which is if you are positive, the time the, the, you have to wait for, uh, to uh, to only have one half of your nuclei remaining, or or if you are feeling negative, the time you have to wait to uh, for half of your nuclei to decay. So the logic is, we'll try, we try to find the time for which n of t is equal to one half of what we started with. So basically we try to find the time at which the exponential is equal to one half and through a little logar uh, logarithm uh, uh, techniques, we can, we can find that the half, uh, the half life is given by the logarithm, uh, the natural logarithm of two over the decay constant. So the, de the decay constant will have the inverse of the units of a time. I forgot to mention it uh, uh, earlier. 
So if we decide to here write the the half uh, the half life in seconds, we do have a decay constant in one over seconds. But we could also decide, and that would, that would be as good as uh, the other choice to write this, for instance, in years. So if we do uh, well, uh, time can be expressed in years, and we have a decay constant in one over years. The important thing is whenever you play around with your, with your exponential, t and lambda need to have matching units. So this is the mainly important part, as long as you are looking at those two together. When you start mixing it with other quantities, seconds are your best bet Well, in order to have uh, SI units. So the half-life, the time you have to wait for half of that, for a, or half of your nuclei to decay. And as we saw, uh, the slope wasn't constant because of the following. So we will call capital R, the decay rate, the, the R also called the activity, the rate of decay. So mainly, how fast do the nuclei decay in your sample? And each of them can decay or not in a given time interval. And all of them are independent. So mainly, the more nuclei you have in your sample, the more decay you should have. Uh, Charlene, do we have to do demonstration? Absolutely not. No, they are not important. We need to show you where the, where the formulas come from. I uh, just so that I, I didn't pull them out, uh, pull them out of, uh, of uh, well, they come from somewhere. That's, uh, that's the point. So, uh, the number of decay you'll measure will be greater if you have more nuclei, and you'll measure less decays if you have less nuclei, since each of them has a given probability to decay. And R is, uh, is, the, is the number of decay, basically, we'll measure in a given time interval, uh, normally, normally per second. So it is minus the rate of change of the number of nuclei, since as we saw, the, here the curve decreases, so the rate of change is negative. But if one R to be the number, the number of decays, we'd like it to be positive, so we just show the uh, minus sign in front to uh, cancel the, this being negative. And through uh, through derivative, we can find two, uh, two, what's the word I'm looking for? equivalent expressions for the rate of decay. First, we can just take this and rewrite this as uh, the, the number of nuclei at a given time. So first expression, the rate of decay at a given time is, is equal to a constant, the decay constant, times the number of nuclei at the same time. Is it is important if you waited two seconds, t equal two seconds, t equal two seconds, the same time. It is, it is also true whenever, uh, whenever you are looking at the time you defined as t equals zero. So through this, the rate of decay at t equals zero will be equal to a constant times the number of nuclei you had initially. This is also valid as long as, as long as the times are the same. Second way to write it, we can define using what we just said, lambda times n0 as the rate of decay at t equals 0. Name this r0 and have an equivalent expression of the rate of decay at a given time t as the rate of decay we had initially in our sample times the same exponential we had in the, uh, in the number of nuclei remaining in our sample. The, the units we'll use for the rate of decay are the following. Uh, so from this, n is just a number. So r will have the same units as the rate uh, as the decay constant, which was in SI units one over seconds. So the rate of decay will also be uh, one over sometimes uh, in, uh, normally one over seconds, which we'll call uh, Becquerel, written b q. 
and other units that, that will pop up sometimes in user sizes, especially when you are dealing with very 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 very, very active uh, radioactive samples, so which have a very large number of decays, would be uh, would be the Curie, which is uh, three uh, three times seven times ten to the power ten becquerel. So generally used whenever you have a very large number of decay, uh, not to carry times to the power the very large amount. So the the rate of decay is the number of decays you measure per per unit of time, and n is the number of remaining nuclei in your sample. And each uh, each uh, at a, a radioactive compound will decay by a rate by by a rate that is its own. So the the decay constant and the half life will depend on the compound on the on the isotope you are studying. And some of them have been studied to some time for some time, and we have some information on them. For instance, one such compound is carbon fourteen. So carbon fourteen is a radioactive isotope of carbon, which then uh, which tends to uh, uh, to decay towards uh, another uh, more stable configuration, which I forgot which one it is. I forgot which one. Anyway, it's ra it's radioactive, so it decays over time, and it's it's generally used whenever you are studying organic samples, not too old, because uh, then the fluctuations will become important since the size of the sample will become very uh, very small. But if the if the fossil is not too old, this is a way we can use to uh, to uh, determine the age of a fossil, since we know how fast it decays, and also in the atmosphere. The total, uh, the total uh, ratio of carbon fourteen compared to the other type of carbons remain constant, and because of this, if the the, the ratio of the nuclei remains the same, the activity, the rate of decay, also does, since the two are linked, are, are proportional to each other. In the, in the atmosphere, you say approximately constant. Of course, it depends if so, some gases are thrown into the atmosphere, so. Especially since the industrial revolution, this changed. Uh, this changed a bit, but for large period of times, it tends to stay approximately the same. And as long as a creature is breathing, it keeps. Uh, well, the atmosphere keeps entering its body uh, uh, through uh, through 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 the creature breathe, breathing. So as long as the creature is alive, the ratio and thus the activity. Of carbon thirteen inside inside its body remains also the same, but when it dies, of course it it stops it stops breathing, so the intake stops. So all uh, all that happens from there is the stockpile that was already already in, in the body will decay without any new supply coming in, and knowing how fast carbon thirteen decays, we can then deduce uh, for how long. Uh, at least a mean value for how long the creature has been deceased. Uh, initially, I had planned for us to also do some calculations based on this. After giving it some, uh, some thought the, over the weekend, I decided to drop the calculation on this and just focus on uh, the general principle behind it. So we know the half-life of carbon-14. We know at least for, uh, before nine, uh, before nine, uh, before uh, we entered the 20th century, so before the huge uh, industrial revolution, what was its activity? And from there, we can deduce the age. So basically, in the equations, we would we would isolate the time t uh, for during which the uh, the organism has been uh, deceased. So this is an application through which we can use uh, the, the 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 decay of radioactive compounds. For other types of samples, for, for, uh, for instance, for older types, we sometimes use some other uh, radioactive uh, radioactive compounds, but with larger uh, life, uh, larger half lives. Uh, carbon fourteen is mainly used for fairly recent uh, uh, deaths because of because of its half life, which is approximately six thousand years. So if you wait six uh, six thousand years, half of your nuclei are gone. Uh, there's six thousand 
half of what's remained afterwards are gone. Another 6,000, half of this, and there's 6,000, uh, 6, uh, uh, 6, another half. So after maybe 20, 25,000 years, most of your sampling is gone. You always have some remaining, but most of it is gone. So as you wait, uh, you get a smaller and smaller sample. So the, the fluctuations get uh, more and more important. The main value you get out of the equations we found get less and less rel uh, reliable. But if you have a compound with a larger lifetime, larger half-life, sorry, you can, uh, you can use it to date uh, older samples. And I think that's pretty much I had to say. Yeah, maybe maybe based on what I said, a, a precision on the half life. So whenever I said it is the time for half a nuclei to decay. So if you start with a given sample, after one half life, you have half of what you initially had at first. If you wait another, you have half of your half, so one quarter remaining. After that, you have half of your quarter, so so an eighth. So it does not take two half lives or all of your sample to be gone, it continues decreasing without ever reaching, at least theoretically, zero nuclei remaining. So uh, that's basically all I had to say based on the rate of the key. So what I suggest, uh, well, first, if you have some questions, so, so far, please uh, write them down. Otherwise, we'll be ready for an example. Otherwise, I suggest we try our hands at an exercise, exercise uh, 21 of chapter uh, 43. So exercise 21, I'll take out my book, uh, adjust my setup, and then I'll be back in approximately uh, three minutes. Just a few moments for me to switch my setup. It won't be long.
All right. So, exercise uh, uh, 43.21. We should study one of the isotopes of, of uranium, uranium 238. Which we're all told has has a lifetime of 4.47 times 10 to the power 9 years. The half-life is 4.47 times 10 to the power 9 years. And the case towards thorium 200 and uh, 34. So I start writing an equation for the decay. For now, incomplete, we'll complete it in time. Uranium turns into thorium and probably something else. By alpha emission. All right. So what, what do we have in the end? Should have should be here some helium. Four, I guess. Yeah, matches. So here uh, we had 238 nucleons. Here thorium has four less because we throw uh, we threw uh, four into here into the helium nucleus. Uh, they first want us to find the decay constant, but first I'll uh, finish the, the the equation here. I still need the number of uh, of protons. So for this, you should have a table at the start of chapter 43. Otherwise, I'll also, I'll also show uh, the tables you will have at your disposal during the exam. Is it here? Looks like it's not, so I'll show the tables. So we're using uranium. So these are the tables you'll have during the exam. Uh, am I showing them? Nope, I'm not. Uh, all right, better. These are tables you'd have. At the start, you will have a periodic table. Afterwards, a table of a bunch of isotopes, their numbers, their mass, and their abundance compared to uh, the given element they correspond to. So we wanted uranium. Uranium has 92. Protons and thorium has 90. This matches. Great. So uh, they wanted to the decay constant. All right. I want to find the decay constant. This is directly linked to the half life. Sorry, right, I again forgot to switch the screen. There. So I want to find the decay constant, lambda. Which is directly linked to uh, the half life. So, knowing, knowing this, we'll be able to find it. The half life we saw was given by the natural logarithm of 2 over the decay constant. So, from this, we'll be able to find the decay constant, which is the natural logarithm of 2 over the half life. Here, uh, I'll take the chance to leave it in years. We'll see later on if it is a mistake, and if so, how to transfer it. So ln of 2 over this, which is expressed in years. So what I'll get for lambda is 1 over years. ln of 2. Seven zero point one five five. I'll keep the I'll keep this much times ten to the minus nine, not nineteen nine. One over years. All right, so we have our first answer. 
Next, uh, we're, we're tasked with finding what mass of uranium is required for uh, to measure an activity of one Curie. So in this, the logic is the following. We are tasked with finding the mass, but the more atoms, the more nuclei we have, the more mass we'll have in our sample. So through this question, what we are asked in this guy is, in, is finding the, the number of nuclei first, using what we saw so far, and then from this number of nuclei, this number of atoms, try to find the mass that this will give us. But first, we'll find the number of nuclei. Even though, uh, so even though the question says the mass, I'll first start with finding the number of nuclei uh, for this. Here I just wrote N, I could also write N of T, but uh, here we only have a single time. So we won't, we won't find N at the same time as we measure an activity of one Curie. I could also write it as one this. But we won't, we won't have to find the time here. But we'll play around with the relation between the rate of decay and the number of nuclei. So uh, to do this, we are told that the rate of decay we measure at this time is one Curie. We'll, tr we'll transfer this into Becquerel to have one over seconds. It is equal to one in Curie. I'll just reorder it to have some more space. Knowing that one Curie is equal to a huge number of Becquerel. I don't actually remember the number, so I'll have to go back to the presentation to find it. 3.7 uh, times 10 to the power 10. So we'll have, well, 3.7 times 10 to the power 10 becquerel. All right. And we know that the rate of decay is linked to the number of nuclei at a given time through the decay constant. But this is what we want to find, at least before finding the mass. This we know. This we know. But so far, the units of these two do not match. Becquerel are one over seconds. We found lambda at first in one over years. This turned out to be a mistake. So we'll have to transfer this into one over seconds to make sure we have the same units on both sides of the equation. So lambda we found as having... So even though I said a mistake, it is never too late to go back. Sometimes some problems, it is easier to keep lambda in, in one of our years, sometimes it is not, but nevertheless, you can always transfer the value you found into new units. So this is what we found in one of our years. To transfer this, we know that in a year, uh, I'll probably do, I probably won't have enough space. I'll probably have to switch lines later on. We have, correct me if I'm wrong, it is 365.25 days. Is it a four or a five again? I think I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's a five. No, it's a four, it's a four. So this is days. In a day, there are 24 hours. And in an hour, if you remember it, you can write it directly. If not, you can also do, do two, two separate steps. There are 3,600 
seconds. If you must remember, one hour is, is 60 minutes, one minute is 60 seconds. You end up with the same result. So with this, we'll have successfully transferred our lambda into seconds since the years cancel, the days cancel, the hours cancel. All that is left are the seconds. So this divided by 264.25 divided by 24. Oh. Uh, All right. Sixty five. All right. Thank you. Let me start over. would be 4.91165 times 10 to the power minus 18 for the power for the power minus 9 plus i had an additional uh, minus 9 in here this is in 1 over seconds now i have the same units for lambda and the rate of the kick m is equal to the rate of the kick over uh sorry is it, yeah the rate of the kick over lambda which is equal to uh, Three point seven times ten to the power ten. This was four point nine one one six five times ten to the power. I love. I found minus eighteen. Three point seven divided by four point something something. Point seven five. Times 10 to the 10 plus 18, 28 nuclei. So this is a straight number, this is a number of nuclei. So we found how many nuclei, and since every atom has one, and one nucleus, we found the number of atoms inside our sample. From there, we'll go and find, well, how much mass does, does this correspond to? To do this, uh, you have the uh, the your first uh, tool. Uh, do we do you have it here? If not, it's in the table. Uh, it's in the table anyway. So you can go back to the table. I put up on the and you will have during the exam. So this column to corresponds to the mass of a neutral atom of this isotope. In, ter in terms of U, and for uranium-238, uh, this is the mass in units of U for this. So basically for this, we'll find the mass of one atom times what we found, and we'll know the mass of our sample. This supposes that all our sample is made up of uranium-238. Of course, since it decays toward, uh, towards uh, thorium, some mass of our sample will actually be thorium. Some might be some other isotope of uranium. But to get out of, to get out of this alive, I'll suppose all of it is made of uranium-238. So, uh, the mass of one atom... ...is from the table... Uh, I'll just write down the number as written here afterwards and switch the screen. It is 238.050783. Keep all the numbers, all of them are good. 
they are very precisely measured. And actually, I go, I'll go and get the value of, of u. It will show you where it is on the on the of uh, on this. The number you had was a number times u. So we want the mass to be in kilograms. So the 238 we found was times u. So 238 point something something times 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram. And with this, I'll switch the screen. So for one atom, we have this mass. So I'll compute it. Uh, pretty fast. Uh, 238.058.3 times 1.6654. So I'd get 295.29. Two eight, let's say, times ten to the power minus twenty seven kilogram for one single atom of uranium two hundred and thirty four uh, two hundred thirty eight. So we have this number. I'll just must multiply the two. The total mass will be equal to this times our number. Even though we have a very large number of atoms, each of them is very light. So we won't get an extravagant mass. Well, at least not that extravagant. I'll just multiply the numbers uh, times 0.7533. I'll still say it would be close to a ton. Uh, this times uh, 28 minus 27 is 10 to the 1. This will be kilograms. What we have to go through? Let's find the mass. We first started with uh, by uh, by deducing that we had to find the number of nuclei and thus of atoms. We transferred the rate of decay from Curie to Becquerel. Same thing with the with lambda. We transferred it from one of her years to one of her seconds. From this, we we're able to relate the two. Find the number of nuclei. Uh, then find the mass of one atom of uranium two hundred and thirty eight, and then find the mass of a bunch of them, you know, the mass of our sample. On this one, questions or comments? Or we move on to the final part of the exercise. Uh, yes, they are on the. Uh, you will also be included with uh, your copy of the exam. Right, so for the last part, we are tasked with finding how many alpha particles, so how many uh, helium-4 nuclei are emitted per second by 
10 grams of uranium. So whenever we are told that we want to find how many alpha particles, if we go back to the equation we wrote at the very beginning of the, of the number, uh, the equation we have is uranium breaking into thorium and uh, a helium-4 nucle nucleus, which is the alpha particle. We have one alpha particle emitted each time one uh, uh, nu nucleus of uranium breaks down. So to find the number of alpha particles are being emitted, in, in reality, what we have to find is, well, how many uh, nuclei of uranium, uh, of uranium break down in a second in our sample. To do this, we saw that the rate, the rate of decay is proportional to the number of nuclei. This is the spirit of R equals uh, lambda times N. So this is proportional to this. And the number of nuclei is proportional to the mass, since each of them has the same mass. So if we know the activity for a given mass, uh, we can use a rule of three in order to find the, 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 the activity, the rate of decay for a different mass of the same kind of atoms, since they are all proportional together. I could also write it down in a more, in a more uh, rigorous way. So the number of nuclei we can write as the mass of the sample over the over the mass of one single atom. So th this is just to, to justify the real the, the real thing we'll start afterwards. But this is the mass of the sample over the mass of one single atom. So if we're to compare two different sample two different samples, let's say sample one and sample two. This stays the same since this only depends on the on the on the isotope. So does the mass of the atom. So again, this is just to justify what is about to happen. If I were to take one over the other, the lambda cancel, the m, the mass of the atom cancel. We can, just, uh, we can just use a rule of, uh, of three uh, uh, in order to do this because this is proportional to the mass of the sample through the number of nuclei in it. So we want to find, basically, we want to find the activity for a sample of 10 grams. And to do this, we'll, we'll do it using the activity you know, we know for the mass of the sample. We just found. Let's see, we want to do this by doing R2 times M simple one over M simple two. The mass of the sample for which we want to find the activity is 10 grams, 10 times 10 to the power of minus three kilograms. We found that for a sample of mass, uh, 2,977.7 kilograms, we had an activity of one Curie, or also in Becquerel, 3.7 times 10 to power uh, to power uh, this times ten. So 
this is 10 to the minus 2. So I get so one two four times ten to power ten my power ten one two three four five so one point twenty four times ten to power five decays per second since we expressed the rate of decay in Becquerel. We have 1.24 times 10 to the power of 5 decays per second. And since one alpha particle is emitted per decay, this is also the number of alpha particles being emitted. If we had, let's say, if, uh, if in a given theoretical reaction we had two alpha particles being emitted per decay, we'd have two times this number alpha particles being emitted per second. So here, we mainly played around with the relation between the rate of decay and the number of nuclei. Some other times, you may have to uh, use the expression with the exponential and uh, use a few algorithms to find either the decay constant or times t. This is another type of problem that can happen. Uh, so every time you, you are told a mass or you are tasked with finding a mass, uh, you can. Uh, uh, you can use what we saw. So the units are in decays per second. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they, 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 sorry. Let me start over. The units of this rigorously are per second. I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot to write the units. I'm terribly sorry. This is one over seconds. Decay. So yes, these are number of decay of decays per second. Absolutely. Because we wrote. Are two in uh, in Becquerel. which are one over second. Other questions. So this is the end of, of the material for uh, well for art of semester actually for and more precisely for nuclear physics and modern physics. So what I suggest we could take a ten minutes break, and afterwards we'll take a look over uh, we'll take a look at the formula sheet as well as the few different tables you have at your disposal both for the exercises and for the exam. I also point out a small difference. I forgot in, a, in the formula sheet I put up on Leah. It was one, there is one equation I forgot to put. Uh, it is added in the version I'll present to you today and the one we'll have on the exam. So, I'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, welcome back. So we'll take a look at the formula sheet, have a short discussion on the more qualitative aspects of the material. And then after we're done with this, uh, we'll be pretty much done for today's class. So it is the same formula sheet I put up on Lea for a small exception. This formula I didn't put on the one on Lea, but it will be included on the one we'll have on the exam. This is, as far as I remember, the only difference. Also, uh, since well, uh, since I myself got confused in the example we did before, I also uh, add the number of days in a year. So you have it at your disposal whenever you want to switch from years to seconds. So in the last part of the course, we studied modern physics, how scientists were, for, were forced to reconsider their understanding of nature based on some new experimental evidence. The first part we studied was quantum mechanics, so how both light and matter had to be studied in a different way than what we had before. First, for light, we introduced the photoelectric effect, which made, which made scientists uh, know that in addition to treating light as an electromagnetic traveling wave. It also had to be, uh, to be considered when interacting with something else as a particle, as a photon. So in the photoelectric effect, light is shown on a given material and is absorbed by the electron in this material and they are ejected from it. So classical physics, uh, theorized that the intensity of the light should have an impact on both the energy and the number of photons and number of electrons being ripped off. This was not observed at all. Instead, the uh, dependency was on the frequency of the light that was being emitted. The larger the frequency, the more energy the electrons had once they were ejected. This was the experiment that introduced the concept of a photon with an energy. E, the energy of the photon, given by H, the Planck constant, a constant that comes up everywhere in quantum mechanics, times F, the frequency of the photon, the, since the photon is uh, what compresses the light, it is the frequency of the light we are sending. H, you have at the bottom, in two different units, generally, it is more advised to use it in joule times seconds to have SI units. If you are so inclined, you can also use it in electron volt times second, electron volt being another unit for the energy, except not uh, in the SI system. It can be understood as, uh, well, here we can, you have a conversion, one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to minus 19 joule. The basic, the basic principle is we just do as if E was equal to one, so that the factorial conversion is the value of E. So if you have a particle of charge E in a potential of 6 volts, its potential energy is 6 electron volts. So it, hel it helps us with that and that, and also uh, well, helps deal with large energies. But you can stick with Joule, uh, it, it'll work as well. So you know, to, in order to get, uh, to get ejected from, from material, one electron uh, absorbs one photon at a time, and this photon gives it the energy it needs to get free. The energy it needs to just get out of the material, uh, I'll take this one, to just get out of the material, which we called the work function phi, is given by, uh, if you want to know the energy of the photon needed, H times F0, F0 being the threshold frequency, the frequency that just manages to eject an electron from the material. The frequency lower than this won't, uh, won't rip electrons of the, of the material at all. And whenever, if an electron, for instance, absorbs a photon with more energy than one just needs, what remains will take the form of kinetic energy. So if, you, if it absorbs some energy, HF, the energy of the photon, if you subtract what it needed to get to, to become free, 
what remains is kinetic energy. And if we focus on the, on the electrons that have the most energy in the atom, uh, this kinetic energy will be uh, the maximum of out, of out of all the electrons being ejected. It, it could also be measured experimentally, knowing the potential we needed to apply between two electrodes to stop the electrons, which we, st which we called the stopping voltage, as being E times the, diff the stopping voltage, the, the, the difference in potential between the two electrodes. This was an experimental way to measure the kinetic energy of the electrons. Also, if you shine some light on a material, the light contains a number of photons. If you want to know the number of photons contained in the light you are, you are sending, we use the logic that if you are sending a single wavelength, a single frequency, all of the photons have the same energy. So if you want to know how many photons you have, you just take the, the total energy you have in, in the light you're sending, divided by the energy of one single photon. This will tell you how many photons you have. For the energy, we can uh, use it knowing the intensity of the light times the area being lit times the time during the, the time during which we send the light. Generally, we want to find, for instance, the, the number of photons per meter squared per second. So A would be one meter squared. T would be one second. And to make the link between uh, the frequency and the wavelength, so here we have the frequency appearing a few times. We use a relation we had the, we had found in the first part of the class, and the speed of a wave is given by the wavelength times its frequency. And if we're dealing with light in vacuum, V here is the speed of light in vacuum, so three times ten to the power eight meters per second. So the first line here is on the photoelectric effect. The energy of the photon I put, I put a bit more uh, higher up since it will also be useful uh, uh, in studying the energy levels. But here, uh, for the photoelectric effect. So this was a hint that we had to reconsider how we study light. For matter, we introduced the De Broglie wavelength, which is given here, the wavelength of a given particle, uh, which can also apply to a particle of matter, which is given by H, again, the Planck constant, over P, the momentum of the particle. If it is a particle uh, generally considered to be of matter, such as an electron, a proton, or something else, P is given by M, the mass times V, the velocity. And also, sometimes we had to uh, find uh, the kinetic energy, or when given some, uh, some information for the kinetic energy, and had to find the, the wavelength. So also remind you the kinetic energy of a classical particle here. Also, this is a way you can use to find the momentum of a photon. Since a photon does not have mass, this is not valid for a photon. But you can use this to find the momentum of a photon by taking h over the wavelength of this photon. This is valid. And we observed diffraction and interference using electrons, using other particles, which was a hint that whenever they traveled, they behaved as waves, but whenever they interacted, they behaved as particles. The wave-like behavior of electrons is what gives rise to the energy levels. The energy levels are nothing else than the allowed energies an electron can have whenever we, uh, whenever it is subject to boundary conditions, whenever it is forced to stay close to uh, the nucleus of an atom, whenever it is bound to the nucleus of an atom. Uh, so yeah, so these levels are created by uh, by the fact that it is bound to jump from one level to another. It can absorb energy, for instance, in the form of a photon. The energy of the photon that will be absorbed will be given by the difference between the energy of the two levels the electron jumps, uh, jumps between. It also, if it jumps down from a higher energy level to a lower one, this also gives you the energy of the photon being emitted. An electron can never, ever be between two energy levels. It is not allowed to have this energy whenever it is bound by an atom. 
and if a photon would uh, would bring it between two levels in a state that it cannot exist, the photon won't be absorbed. And in the case of uh, the hydrogen atom, the Bohr uh, the Bohr model gave us the energy of the levels given the index of the level n, with n equal one being the fundamental, all of the others being being excited states, excited levels. And if you have another ion with a single electron, but possibly more protons, you can also use this to find the energy of the levels, knowing the number of protons that the nucleus contains. End of quantum mechanics. Both light and matter behave as waves when traveling, as particles when interacting, and we studied energy levels. Questions or comments on this part? Otherwise, the second part, uh, nuclear physics. So uh, we first uh, saw that, well, for, uh, nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, collectively known as, uh, known as nucleons. Mass is nothing but another form of energy. You can create mass, you can destroy it, as long as the total energy uh, with all the uh, with all of its different forms considered, remains conserved. Uh, the, the binding energy, the energy that binds a given nucleus together, can be uh, found by uh, taking the difference of the mass of all the components minus the mass of the nucleus times c squared through the mass energy equivalence. And we had rearranged this to have masses of neutral atoms instead of just nucleus, in the nucle a nucleus, individual protons, individual neutrons, by following what happens to all the electrons around uh, the nucleus. This is a principle that's still important later on. It's also something we, you may have to keep in mind in the, in the exercises. Sometimes you may have to consider an extra electron either at the start or at the, or at, or at the end for uh, all of them to balance. So we had rearranged the electrons and the protons to get hydrogen atoms, here neutrons, here nucleus, to get the mass we had before, uh, of all the components minus the mass of the atom itself, the difference non-zero being the binding energy. So mass is not conserved by itself. Uh, next, you can find the binding energy per nucleon by dividing this by a, the number of nucleons inside of the nucleus. Some are more stable than others. Will decay if they are unstable? Three different types of decays. Uh, first, alpha decay, for which you have uh, the equation for the energy being either emitted or absorbed in this type of decay. With, uh, so this refers to uh, the x and y refer to this. x is something you have at first, y is something you have in the end. A and B are some of the particles you may have, Q being the energy. So the general principle is the mass you have before minus the mass you have after times C squared gives you uh, Q, uh, the, 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 the energy of this reaction. Whenever I presented it, I forgot the C squared uh, in these expressions. The, the, uh, the presentation was put up again on layout to make up for it. So we use this principle, the mass bef uh, before minus the mass after times c squared to find different relations for alpha decay, beta minus decay, where electron is produced by the transformation of a neutron into a proton, 
and here with better plus the key uh, with positron being emitted by the uh, the transformation of a proton into a neutron beta plus decay is also used in uh, the PET scan, the positron emission tomography uh, technique for imaging the, the interior of uh, the body of a patient. This is used in uh, tomography. Because a positron, whenever it meets an electron, uh, they annihilate, they destroy each other, and emit two photons in opposite direction, which are then detected. So they give off energy whenever they annihilate in the form of photons. Two, because of, the because of the conservation of momentum. We have this type of decays. We also have ge other general reactions. So you, you can have some other uh, without having explicitly alpha, beta, uh, or gamma decay. You can have some other general nuclear reaction. The basic principle stays the same. To find energy in this reaction, it is the mass you had in the beginning minus the mass you have at the end. Always make sure to follow the electrons in case you have one extra, either at the, at the other start of the, or, at the, or at the end. Q is positive if the reaction is exothermic. If it is, the reaction can happen on its own. It is negative if it is endothermic. In this case, we need to give energy in order for the reaction to take place. It won't happen without external intervention. Uh, we have two different types of uh, of nuclear reaction, fission and fusion. Fission takes place into uh, traditional atomic bombs and uh, nuclear reactors in which we have a chain reaction, usually with uranium, the breakdown of one nucleus sending neutrons, which then provoke the, the breakdown of other nuclei, which send even more neutrons. So fission, a large nucleus breaks down into smaller ones. Fission, a small nuclei, Combining to a larger one, it is. I mean, it is uh, the source of energy of the stars, and what uh, what enables them to start from hydrogen and create all of the elements we encounter uh, in our universe. The stars can be seen as uh, factories for elements. Uh, yeah, for the calculations, some tools we'll need are at the bottom here. Uh, first, for the masses. You have uh, the different tables. So in case you need to find a particular uh, element given a particular number of protons, I give you a periodic table of the elements, which you have with the average mass uh, taking into account all the isotopes, uh, the name, the, the symbol, and everything. Next, you have a table of uh, some elements with the number of protons the symbol of the different isotopes so for instance helium you have helium 3 helium 4 you have others but with uh, with a smaller chance the mass with uh, times u the uh, the, at uh, the atomic uh, mass unit which i'll introduce in a few moments so this would the mass of helium 3 would be 3.01 something something times u and how abundant it is it would have been useful especially for and let's say little carbon 14, otherwise not that useful. You have uh, you have these uh, inf the, these information for a whole bunch of different nuclei. For other particles, I give you the mass of an electron both in kilograms and in, in units of U. Same thing for a proton and a neutron. I also remind you that U is this value in Kilogram. In all of the energies, you always have the U times C squared, which is why it is useful to have a given value directly for this. So you can just replace U times C squared by this value. And uh, yeah, that's about it for this part. Next, these decays do not happen all at once, they, they happen over time. To introduce the rate of decay, the, uh, the activity of a given uh, isotope. We have the relation between the number of nuclei we have at a given time, knowing how many we had at the beginning, which decreases over time with an exponential decay, with lambda, the decay constant, the probability of a, of a decay happening per unit of time. We have the half-life of, uh, of, of a given isotope, which is directly linked to lambda, the probability. 
we can also get we can also have a gap check that I didn't do earlier of why this makes sense. If the probability of a decay is higher, well, it'll take less time for half of our nuclei to be gone. So this is why they behave in the inverse of each other. Was introduced the rate of decay r as being the number of decays per unit of time, generally per second if we are using Becquerel, which is proportional to the number of nuclei we have remaining. And also because of this behaves as a decreasing exponential. So uh, to this, if you are if you are given the mass of a sample, you may have to go in the table as we did to find the mass of a given atom. Use u. If you are most more used to it and want to use the mass per mole, for instance, I also provide you the Avogadro constant if you prefer to go that route. It is also valid. Also put up uh, to remind you that we can we can use uh, the rate of decay to date fossils. I put you some information in comment fourteen. Would have you, we would have used them in the calculation. Here it is more or less a reminder that it is a radioactive isotope, and this is why you can use it to date samples using how fast it decays. And you have a bunch of prefixes. Well, uh, what do uh, so, uh, well, what is the power associated with each different prefix? And that would be pretty much everything uh, I think is uh, is essential on this part. On the short revision we just did, is there any question, any comments, something you would like us to go over once more? As I said, I also put up the number of days in a, uh, of days in a year. So this will be added in the in the section uh, uh, with the constant at the bottom. I may drop the the Boltzmann constant since we ended up not using it. So I may put the the number of days in a year here instead. Otherwise, I'll be available on Zoom both tomorrow morning and uh, Wednesday to answer your questions if you have any. Uh, on Wednesday, would you prefer us to, uh, to have class at 5 or to have it earlier, like, I, like at 1? Which one would you prefer? So far, one. Jonathan, Paige, uh, who else is missing? Charlene, and uh, who else is missing? Elian, do you have any preference? All right, so one it is. So Wednesday at one. Uh, also, just a short note. Uh, yesterday it was, yeah, I think it was yesterday. Uh, so I, I switched the, the last study guide. I just removed the exercises that I had first put on the carbon-14. So this is the only change I made. I removed them, put it in a small section at the end if you're ever interested. If not, I won't ask you a question on them. 
So it was the change I made while I updated the study guide uh, over the weekend. So otherwise, uh, that's pretty much all for today. So if you if you want to join in tomorrow and uh, at one on Wednesday, so I'll be I'll be available on Zoom to answer your questions. If you would like us to do some more example, this is also an option that is available. But no new material. So, uh, well, that's all for today. So have a nice day and thank you for being here. Bye-bye.